Hi, I'm Mr. Wahlberg, and I'm glad you're here. After becoming president, Franklin Roosevelt used government programs to combat the Great Depression. Americans still benefit from some of these programs uh, that were begun in the New Deal, like the bank and stock market regulations and things like the Tennessee Valley Authority. So, dear students, incline your ear and hear our stories that you might find your place among his delights. <laughs> We have three objectives today. By the end of this class, you should be able to summarize the initial steps that Roosevelt took to reform banking and finance. You should be able to identify, or you should be able to describe New Deal work programs, and also to identify some critics of Roosevelt's New Deal. But let's begin in Roman numeral number nine. Uh, the term that Roosevelt would use to describe his economic plan for combating the Great Depression was that of the New Deal. Uh, in 1932, the presidential election showed that Americans were clearly ready for some kind of a change from the Hoover administration. Because of the Depression, people were suffering from a lack of work and a lack of food and, and a really a lack of hope. Although Republicans re-nominated Hoover as their candidate, they recognized that he had really pretty little chance of winning. Too many Americans blamed Hoover for doing too little about the Depression, and they, they were were ready for a new president. The Democrats pinned their hopes on Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a known popular known popularly as FDR. He was the two-term governor of New York and a distant cousin of the former president Theodore Roosevelt. As governor, FDR had proved to be, proven to be an effective, reform-minded leader, working to combat the problems of unemployment and poverty. Unlike Hoover, Roosevelt possessed this like can-do attitude and projected an air of friendliness and confidence that really attracted voters. It was in sharp contrast to what what Hoover had done, where he basically said that the government and the presidency shouldn't do. Roosevelt won an overwhelming victory, and he captured nearly 23 million votes to Hoover's somewhere around 16 million. In the United States Senate, Democrats claimed nearly two-thirds majority. In the House, they won almost three-fourths of the seats, and it was their greatest victory since the Civil War. So we see a lot of parts of the government are riding on Roosevelt's coattails. Sub point B. Four months would elapse between the time that Roosevelt would win office and uh, in the November election and when he would actually be inaugurated in March of 1933. Today, uh, you know, we're, we live in a time since the 20th Amendment, which moved the presidential inaugurations to January. But that wasn't in, ratified until the second year of Roosevelt's term. So uh, it didn't apply to the 1932 election. So there's like this big lag time between when he's elected and when he actually gets to take office. Roosevelt wasn't idle during that time, though. He was really very active in getting his government set up. He worked with this team of carefully picked advisors, uh, a group of professors and lawyers and journalists that, that he began to refer to as the Brain Trust. Uh, Roosevelt also began to formulate a set of policies for his new administration to go alleviate the problems of the um, of the Great Depression. It was known as the New Deal, and it was a phrase taken from a campaign speech in which Roosevelt had promised a, a new deal for the American people. He also promised policies focused generally on three type of policy goals, relief for the needy, economic recovery, and financial reform. So point C. Once he took office, uh, Roosevelt, the Roosevelt administration launched a period of really intense activities in getting these policies off the ground, known uh, popularly as the 100 Days, and it lasted from March 9th until June 16th of 1933. During this period of time, Congress passed more than 15 major pieces of New Deal legislation. Uh, these new laws and the others that followed significantly expanded the federal government's role in the nation's economy. Roosevelt's first real step as president was to carry out reforms in banking and in finance. And by 1933, uh, the banks were in a real mess. Widespread bank failures had caused most Americans to just lose faith in banks altogether. And if they would be accumulating money, they certainly didn't put it into a banking system. So on March 5th, one day after taking office, Roosevelt uh, declared a bank holiday and basically just single-handedly closed all the banks in the country. And that would prevent any future withdrawals or any further withdrawals. If anybody wanted to get their money out of the bank. They couldn't. The banks were closed. He persuaded Congress also to go past the Emergency Banking Relief Act. This Emergency Banking Relief Act authorized the Treasury Department to go inspect the county's banks. Those that were sound could reopen at once, and those that were insolvent, and insolvent means they were unable to go pay for their debts, those banks would remain closed for a while. Uh, those that needed help could maybe receive loans from uh, you know the government or from other banks. And this measure revived public confidence in banks. Uh, 
since customers now had greater faith that the banks that were opened were in good financial shape. They had passed the scrutiny of the Roosevelt administration. Sub point D. On March 12th, the day right before those first banks were to reopen, President Roosevelt gave the first of many what became known as fireside chats. The fireside chats were radio conversations. They talked about issues of public concern. They Roosevelt would go explain in real clear and simple language what his plan was for these New Deal measures. These informal talks made Americans feel like the, the president was talking right to them. They weren't really recorded next to a fireplace, and people didn't necessarily listen to them next to a fireplace, but they were called fireside chats because they felt like they were Roosevelt was a part of their home and a person they would know and invite into their house. In the first of these fireside chats, Roosevelt explained why the nation's welfare uh, depended on public support of the government and of the banking system. He says, we've provided the machinery to restore our financial system. He, and he said, and it's up to you to support and make it work. And then he explained the banking system to the listeners. The president explained that if too many people demanded all of their savings at once, the, the banks would fail. They just don't keep that kind of cash around. And it wasn't because the banks were weak, but it, because even strong Strong banks that are well capitalized would have a hard time meeting those kind of demands. And over the next few weeks, a lot of Americans began to return their savings to the banks, understanding a little bit better how the banking system would work. So point E, Congress took another step to go reorganize the banking system by passing a law known as the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933. Glass-Steagall established the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or the FDIC, and it provided bank customers that it with, really with um, the proof that their money was going to be safe. Uh, it was going to be safe because there was federal insurance for each bank account up to at the time five thousand dollars reassuring millions of bank customers that their their money would would be there if they left it there it also required banks to act cautiously with their customers money they couldn't be reckless about it or couldn't you know be uh make make foolish loans congress and the president also worked to go regulate the stock market in which people had lost their faith in the stock market because of the crash of 1929 so the federal securities act was passed in may of 1933 and it required corporations to go provide complete information on all stock offerings and it also made these companies that were publicly traded liable for any of the misrepresentations along the way in june of 1934 congress also created the securities and exchange commission we think of it today as the sec to regulate the stock market. One of the goals of the SEC was to prevent pe was to uh, prevent people with inside information from uh, about companies from rigging the stock market for their own profit. It basically meant if the, if countries gonna, if companies are going to be publicly traded in Wall Street on the stock exchange, then there can't be secret information that uh, allows some people to really profit on the deal. In addition, Roosevelt persuaded Congress to go approve a bill allowing the manufacture and sale of some kinds of alcoholic beverages. This bill's main purpose was to raise government revenue by taxing alcohol. And by the end of 1933, the passage of the 21st Amendment repealed prohibition altogether, and the prohibition era comes to an end. Revenue Numeral number 10. Here we're going to talk about some of the specific programs for targeting American people, and we'll begin in Roman in uh, subpoint A of rural assistance. Here there's going to be a whole lot of acronyms. We've already gone through a couple of them, things like the SEC, right? Uh, there's a whole bunch of acronyms. Sometimes history teachers refer to it as the New Deal alphabet soup, like scoop in your spoon and pull out three or four letters and hey that's probably a new deal program so point a uh the agricultural adjustment act known as the aaa sought to raise crop prices by lowering production uh so basically to like get farmers to stop producing so many crops and raising so many animals and the government then would try to pay farmers to leave a certain amount of the, every acre of land unseeded basically just don't turn that into food production the theory was that they would reduce the supply of food reaching the market which would raise the prices of food and that would uh, help farmers out. In some cases, crops, you know, just couldn't be, you know, I mean, they're going to pass this law and it's going to go into effect right out of the way. And sometimes they're just it was too late. They'd already planted the crops and they were ready to go harvest and go to market. So they were far too advanced uh, for acreage reduction to take effect. So as a result, the government paid cotton growers, for instance, around $200 million to go plow under their crop, crop which could go to market, but instead just, just des destroy it and go create a shortage in the market. They also paid hog farmers to go slaughter 6 million pigs and to never take the hogs for pork production. The policy was pretty upsetting to a lot of Americans who protested the destruction of food 
food. They said, why are you destroying food when there's so many people going hungry? It did, however, have some effect that it raised crop prices, it raised farm prices, and, and put money back in the pockets of farmers. Uh, it's an especially ambitious program of regional development was that of the Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA. This is another rural program. It was established on May 18th of 1933. The TVA focused on the badly depressed area of the Tennessee River Valley. The TVA renovated five existing dams along the Tennessee River and constructed 20 new ones. That created thousands of jobs, just those like construction jobs to start with, but it also provided flood control and hydroelectric power and other benefits to an impoverished region. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, like my dog has climbed under the desk. Uh, so, but that, uh, goes and, uh, creates infrastructure for a part of the country that didn't even have electricity or a lot of running water to it. So point B, um, there was also work projects and work projects are basically just organized efforts to go create jobs for people. And some of these are probably the most famous of the New Deal programs. The first one we'll talk about is the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, which put young men aged 50, you know, 18 to 25 years old to go work building roads and developing parks and planting trees and go helping in soil erosion projects and flood control projects. By the time the program ended in 1942, the CCC had almost 3 million people which had passed through um, its time. The uh, the CCC paid a small wage of $30 a month, which was not even a big number in, you know, 1930. Dollars um, of that, of those thirty dollars a month, twenty five of it was automatically sent home to the worker's family. Like the worker themselves never even got a chance to get it. It was entirely a way of providing for the families. Um, it also provided free food and uniforms and lodging and work camps and and basically, while like the man of the family was off at work, he's his needs are being taken care of. But the family back at home is receiving the the payment for the wages as well. A lot of the camps were located in the Great Plains several of them here in my favorite state of Kansas. And with there, within uh, within a period of eight years, a lot of the men of the CCC were planting more than 200 million trees. This tremendous restoration, really a reforestation program, aimed at preventing another dust bowl and to go secure up you know, like the soil for erosion factors. The next organization we'll talk about is the is the PWA, the Public Works Administration. It was created in June of 1933 as part of the National Industrial Recovery Act, the NRA, the NIRA. It provided money to states to go create jobs, chiefly in the construction of buildings like schools and community buildings. Um, when these programs, they, they failed to sufficiently help uh, unemployment, so Roosevelt um, established another organization called the CWA, the, the Civil Works Administration, in November of 1933. That provided four Four million immediate jobs during the winter of 1933 to 1934, and these were entirely like, "Hey, let's go build a school." And they wouldn't build a school. Some of the critics of the CWA said that the programs were really not legitimate company, legitimate jobs. They were make work. This isn't like just find some work for something to do. And they were really a waste of money. The CWA did go on to build 40,000 schools and pay the salaries of more than 50 million school teachers in America's rural areas. It also built more than half a million miles of roads along the way. Um, the yep the NR the uh, they also the the New Deal also tried to go promote fair business practices as well. Take the NIRA, the National Recovery Administration. Uh, the NI okay, so the NIRA is the National uh, Industrial Recovery Act, which created the NRA, the National Recovery Administration. Now NRA is also the National Rifle Association, and they're unrelated. They just have the same alphabet soup. The NRA is a New Deal program. is the National Recovery Administration, which set the prices of a lot of products and established standards. Basically said that like uh, a loaf of bread is going to cost this much amount of money and it can't cost more and it's not going to cost less. Like they're going to set a fixed price for that. Uh, and Americans don't generally like this. We don't like to think of the government going and telling you this is how much you have to go pay for a I don't know, a car or something like that. But uh, in a time of really uh, uncertainty, a lot of Americans accepted this as a, you know, something that could go. The aim of the NRA was to go promote recovery by interrupting the trend of wage cuts and falling prices and layoffs. But a lot of uh, businesses and a lot of politicians were critical of the NRA, saying that this was a big overstep. Charges um, argued that the codes served large business interests, and they weren't really about protecting small businesses or individual workers. They were about protecting big business along the way. There were also charges of increasing code violations violations that people would, you know, try to go and skirt the NRA regulations along the way. So point D, a number of New Deal programs were concerned uh, with housing and home mortgage problems, trying to make sure that people had a reliable place to live. The homeowners, the Loan Corporation, H-O-L-C, provided government loans to homeowners who faced foreclosures because they couldn't meet their loan payments. Like people that had owned their house, you know, had to go pay the bank for it, but um, then fell in hard times. The H-O-L-C would go and 
try to provide new loans to go bail out the homeowners along the way. In addition, the 1934 Federal National Housing Act created the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA. This agency continues even today to go furnish uh, loans for uh, like home mortgages and repairs for people. And the FHA is still really active in getting people, uh, you know, a place to live. Another program, uh, FERA, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, was funded by a $500 million um, of uh, federal dollars to go provide direct relief to the needy. The FERA, basically half of the money was given to the states as direct grants and aid to go help furnish food and clothing to the unemployed, the aged, and the ill, and basically just like, here is cash go take care of people. The rest was distributed to states for work relief programs. For every, you know, say like three dollars within the state program, FIRA would go donate one dollar to it. Say like, hey, if you've got a if, if Kansas has a work program as well, then FIRA will go contribute to that to go expand the program. Whereas money people money helped people buy food, this was also meaningful work that helped them gain confidence and self respect. And all of that was basically other efforts to go get people jobs and help them out along the way. Roman numeral number eleven. Uh, the New Deal though wasn't uh, universally lauded. Not everybody liked and they didn't like it for various reasons. Let's talk about a few of them. By the end of the 100 days, millions of Americans have benefited from the New Deal programs and the public confidence in the nation's future had rebounded. Basically, like even though they don't solve the problem of the New Deal, at least it looks like the government is doing something. And that goes a long way with the American public. Uh, although President Roosevelt agreed to a policy of deficit spending, spending more than the government receives in revenue, uh, he, you know, basically he says like, uh, so we don't, we're, you know, the, the economy's down. We're not bringing in that much tax money, but we're going to have to go spend a lot of money, which means we have to borrow money, which means the government's going to go into debt. And Roosevelt's like, I'm on board for this. It needs to be done. I don't love it. And I don't want to do it crazy, but I'm doing it. Um, he did so with great reluctance. He regarded deficit spending as basically a necessary evil, a uh, necessary evil will be only used at a time of great economic crisis. However, the new deal didn't really end the depression, even though he's, you know, trying to go create jobs to go create money along the way. It doesn't. It didn't solve the problems, and that drew a lot of critics for it. Uh, and it drew critics on both sides of the aisle. But basically, liberal critics argue the New Deal didn't go far enough to go help the poor and reform the nation's economy. Conservative critics on the other side said Roosevelt spent way too much money on direct relief, and they used New Deal policies to go control businesses and socialize the economy. Conservatives were particularly angered by laws such as the Agricultural Adjustment Act and the National Industrial Recovery Act, which they said gave the government far too much control over agriculture and industry. It basically says that like the government just shouldn't be in involved in these things and it's way too much overreach so point b the supreme court also got involved in like what could be expected out of the government but the mid-1930s conservative opposition to the new deal received a boost from two significant supreme court decisions in 1935 the supreme court struck down the nra basically saying it was unconstitutional it declared that the law gave legislative powers to the executive branch it says what you're doing is the executive branch is going and making laws but that's not the way the government works the legislative branch makes the laws the executive branch enforces them and carries them out and he says the enforcement of industri industry codes within states went far beyond what the federal government could do. The Constitution gives the federal government power to regulate interstate commerce, not go regulate all commerce. The next year, the Supreme Court struck down the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, on the grounds that agriculture is entirely a local matter, and it should be regulated by the states rather than by the federal government. I mean, very few farms at all would go cross into two states at the same time, and that's really not what the federal government should do. There are constitutional limits, even in times of crisis. Fearing that the court decisions might dismantle the New Deal, President Roosevelt said in, in February of 1937 that basically said, Congress, I need you to solve this problem for me. I need you to enact a court reform bill to go reorganize the judiciary. The Supreme Court is getting in the way of real reform, and um, and we got to change it. The Supreme Court, just like the entire federal court system, needs to be overhauled. And uh, he asked Congress to go write this bill to let him appoint six new Supreme Court justices. We refer to this often as the court packing bill, saying that, like, okay, so there's nine justices to the Supreme Court, they, Roosevelt doesn't have a majority, the Supreme Court doesn't agree with them, they're turning all these things over, and Roosevelt says, well, let's just add more justices to the Supreme Court. There's no reason it has to be nine, it's only by tradition, the, the Constitution doesn't say there could be nine, what if there was 15? Huh? Let's get 15 justices on there. And then Roosevelt knew that he could go and cook the majority and the Supreme Court would just rubber stamp whatever he wanted to go do. Um, many people thought that the president, this was an overstepping of his bounds. This was violating uh, judicial independence and it got rid of the separation of powers. Basically said, the, Roosevelt, that sounds like cheating. Like, uh, I'm not on board with it. Roosevelt got his way anyway without re reorganizing the judiciary. In 1937, an elderly justice retired, and Roosevelt went and replaced that conservative elderly justice with a very liberal judge named Hugo Black, and it shifted the balance of the Supreme Court. Rulings of the Supreme Court began to favor the New Deal, and over the next four years, because of further resignations, Roosevelt was able to appoint seven new justices, seven of the nine who Roosevelt meant along the way. So point C. 
There were other critics as well. In 1934, some of the strongest conservative opponents of the New Deal banded together to form an organization called the American Liberty League. The American Liberty League opposed New Deal measures because they believed it violated respect for the individual rights of individuals and property. Um, but there were other critics as well. They weren't just conservative critics. And I think some of the liberal critics were the most interesting of them. Take, for instance, Father Charles Coughlin. So Father Charles Coughlin was a Roman Catholic priest from the suburb of Detroit. And he broadcast these radio sermons. He had a radio program that was like a big broadcasting was wildly popular. And his radio sermons combined economic issues and political issues and religious ideas. Although over time, there wasn't actually that much about religion, even though he was a Catholic priest. He, he kind of strayed away from those topics. Um, he uh, he was initially a supporter of their New Deal. It thought that Roosevelt was the man, but Roosevelt soon turned. To, I mean, Coughlin soon turned against Roosevelt. Uh, he didn't think Roosevelt was going nearly far enough. Coughlin favored a guaranteed annual income, saying that, like we should just guarantee a minimum wage that everybody's going to go make, and the government will just go hand them that money if they don't make it. Coughlin soon. Um, he also argued for the nationalization of banks, saying that banks shouldn't be businesses; they shouldn't be run individually. The government should just take them all over and have the government run all of the banks all together. At the height of his popularity, Father Coughlin had a radio audience of as many as many of like 40 to 45 million people. It was a huge radio audience in the 1930s. But um, over time, he became increasingly unpopular for uh, his reasons. Uh, his rhetoric turned anti-Semitic, like anti-Jewish rhetoric, and, and eventually cost him his support along the way. Another critic, though, was Francis Townsend. Francis Townsend, Dr. Townsend, was a physician. He was a health officer in Long Beach, California. He believed that Roosevelt also wasn't doing enough to go help the poor and the elderly. So Townsend developed a different kind of argument where he said there ought to be this pension plan that should go develop, uh, provide monthly benefits to the aged. Well, Coughlin, you know, Father Coughlin wanted to go and like have uh, care for the poor. Uh, Townsend, his really interest is in the elderly. And he says that uh, we need to have some kind of a new, uh, you know, aging program for the elderly along the way. Um, and, uh, Hit the found the the plan found really strong backing among the elderly, uh, undermining their support for Roosevelt and instead favoring Townsend and his, you know, band of politicians as well. Perhaps the most serious challenge of the New Deal was a guy named Senator Huey Long. Huey Long was from Louisiana and like Coughlin, he was early a supporter of, of the New Deal. But like Coughlin, he would later go turn against Roosevelt. Long was probably going to run for president. He was eager to go run for the presidency himself. He uh, proposed a nationwide social program that he called Share Our Wealth. The Share Our Wealth plan uh, used the slogan, uh, every man a king. And he says, uh, and he promised basically something for everybody along the way. The Every Man a King Share Our Wealth program. Uh, Long's program was very popular. Very, very popular. In 1935, he boasted of having perhaps as many as 27,000 of these Share Our Wealth clubs and 7.5 million members in you know, states across the country. Country. That same year, though, at the height of his popularity, uh, Huey Long was assassinated. He was assassinated by a lone gunman, um, a guy named Dr. Weiss. Um, and then so Dr. Weiss shoots Huey Long and then Huey Long has bodyguards who go and shoot Weiss and they they shot him 60, 61, maybe 62 times. It actually kind of got hard to count it after a while. Uh, and we never really know Vice's motives. It will forever be one of the great mysteries that conspiracy theorists just love to muse on. At the end of the, at the initial evidence of the New Deal began to wave. President Roosevelt started to look ahead. He basically said, "Okay, so the New Deal." It's kind of working. It's not really working. They're going to come up with a new plan and solve the nation's economic programs. Those new deals, the new new deal, a second new deal, it's all in the works, and I can't wait to tell you about it. Make sure you like and subscribe. God bless you.